Hey there, Duke fans. Welcome to episode 616 of the DBR podcast, the Duke Basketball Roundup. I'm Jason Evans. You know, Donald was actually with me a couple seconds ago, but he's having computer problems. And we have a special guest. So I didn't want to delay things any further. We are about to bring you part one of our very extensive preview of the Houston Cougars, the team that Duke will be facing on Friday in the NCAA Sweet 16, an outstanding club. And the best way to bring you a preview of this team is to go to an absolute expert on them. I am joined now live by Jeremy Branham of Houston Basketball Radio. Jeremy is the voice of the Cougars. Jeremy, I think you said, what, it's like seven years or so you've been doing this? You've been calling the play-by-play? Yeah, yeah, you're seven to do men's basketball. I did 10 years of women's basketball prior to that. Uh, I've actually been into Cameron Indoor twice. Once really? for a women's game. I think we got beat by 40. <laughs> uh, you guys had a point guard, I think, from Houston. I think from Cy Fair in Houston. Can't remember the name, though. And then we practiced baseball there, I think, ahead of a trip against East Carolina. I don't know why we practiced there, but we practiced there, and then we just walked through Cameron Indoor. So I've been there twice. Really cool place. It is a fun place to see a basketball game. There's no question about that. All right, let's get to the reason we have you on, which is to tell us a bit about your team, the Houston Cougars. Um, Look, big year for you guys. First year in the Big 12, and you win the conference regular season. You get a number one seed in the NCAA tournament. Uh, uh, Any transition, anything different about this year's Houston club, versus the past few years when you were not in a power conference? No, it's the opposite, really. And I think that the the program takes pride in that it's the opposite. Uh, Kelvin Sampson's asked about that all the time, and I, I think he gets a little annoyed whenever he's asked. No, we don't do anything different. Like we, We've been this quality of a program for quite some time now. Uh, we've been this good for a while now. Just because we were in the American last year and the Big 12 this year didn't change who we were. It might have changed your opinion of who we are, but it didn't change who we were. Uh, they had the, their pillars, their things that they, you know, are, that are important to them. Uh, they call it a holy trinity. Uh, offensive, they are just rebounding in general, defense, taking care of the basketball. That's the holy trinity of that program. And they, they work on that every day. If you're not going to buy into that, you're not going to play in this program. So it's something that you get conditioned to do. It's something that the players develop and – you know, you, you work on getting better each and every day of practice. You play a game, what worked, what didn't work, what areas do we need to correct, and you work on that throughout the entire season. And Houston's been good for a long time. They haven't changed a single thing that they've done once they you know moved to the Big 12. The only difference is the schedule, and you know Houston was lucky enough to, to have a, a good season, win a bunch of basketball games, and be in the position that they're in right now. So you'd say that holy trinity, the defense, protecting the ball on offense, mm-hmm. And rebounding hard, hard, hard. Uh, we're big on headlines on this show. We ask our listeners to give us headlines after every single game. If you had a headline to describe Houston this year, what would it be? I would probably go with tough. Um, you, you look at this program and you you look at a couple of the key words that, that really describe it. You know, physical, uh, hard-nosed smart, don't beat themselves. And I think that you can kind of summarize that all with tough. You know, you're going to, when you play Houston, you're going to get a tough game. Uh, When you get Houston on the defensive side of the ball, they're going to be tough. Uh, Offensively, you know, they're going to get a shot. They're going to go try to rebound the missed shot. They're going to be tough. They're a tough out. Um, And I think that it's been like that for quite a while under Kelvin Sampson, that this is the program that, He wants, this is the program that he demands. He recruits to the program and the recruit brings in players that are going to, you know, play that kind of style. So I I would say tough. If if I could headline the season, I would say tough. So there's a weird thing about Houston compared to most other teams in that uh, their two best players are small guards. Uh, LJ Cryer and Jamal Shedd are both like 6'1", maybe 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. Um, But they've been, I mean, incredible this season. Talk to me a little bit about it. What's their secret sauce? How are they getting this done? Yeah, uh, on the defensive end, they're just both really good on-ball defenders. Uh, Shed Shed has had a reputation for being a really good on-ball defender for a while. Uh, he was the defensive player of the year of the American last year. So he, he's had that reputation uh, and then followed that up with the Big 12 defensive player of the year. You know, people call him one of the 
best defensive point guards in the country. He's strong. You know, he might not be the tallest. You're right, uh, but he's he's strong. He's wide. He's thick. Uh, so it's hard to. You know, it's hard to get around him with his speed, his quickness, and then he has the physicality and the size to kind of try to try to cope with some taller guards. And then LJ Cryer actually came in with a reputation for a guy who wasn't good defensively, and I think that bothered LJ. Uh, LJ believes that he is a good defender, and I think that he's had that belief for quite some time. And when he was getting that label, I don't think he appreciated that. And I think it's part of why he came to Houston, quite frankly. He, I haven't heard him say that, but you know, you know what you're getting whenever you come to Houston. So he's never shied away from that. He's uh, he's embraced that. He has seen that, you know, face on. And he's been uh, really good in that that as well. He, he's quick. Uh, he's thick, too. He's pretty strong. And then on the offensive side, Shed's quickness. Um, probably about game four, game five of the Big 12 season that he was asked to be a little bit more of a scorer. Uh, so he's been getting to the rim much more, finishing at the rim. Uh, good leaping ability. His shot's gotten much better over the years. You know, never a volume three-point shooter. It's always been, can he knock it down? And this year he's been able to knock it down. Uh, so his speed, his quickness, his ability to finish at the rim, get other guys involved. And then LJ's strengths offensively is that he's really quick. He's good off the ball. Um, he's good coming off of screens. And then he's just a really good shooter. Um, that would be his his biggest strength is that he can, he can shoot the rock. So, uh, Donald has actually fixed his computer problems <laughs> and he has now joined us. I know he wants you to ask you about, about the big man. Go ahead, Donald. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Ladies and gentlemen, technology sometimes gets the best of us, but uh, Jeremy, great to have you on. Uh, you talked about the big men or I'm sorry. You talked about the little guys. Let's talk about the big men. And I know some guys have been hurt uh, recently or fi- fighting through some injuries. I think the thing about you, you mentioned the toughness and and the strength that, this team possesses. I think it's no, it's present more in the big men in some ways because they're not that tall. And in some of these games, we've seen that being tall is somewhat required to be a big man. So how does Houston get around that? How do they make up for their lack of height uh, with their strength and, and be able to fight off some, especially in the big 12, where you have a lot of teams that have seven foot seven, two guys that are banging in the post every night. Yeah, Samson doesn't really value height as much as he values other things. Uh, He's a big wingspan guy. He's a big leaping ability guy. And he is a big quickness guy. He he wants his bigs to be quick. Uh, And what they do defensively, they they need to be quick. Uh, So he'll trade off a little bit of height at times for the other things that he values more. Not to say that he completely devalues size. It's that the other things matter more in what he wants to do defensively. Um, so those are that's what they counter it with. Uh, they counter it with their lengths. Uh, it might not be seven footers, but you know six eight, six nine. Um, they have really long wingspans, especially Javier Francis. Javier Francis, it's ridiculous how long his arms are. Jojo Tugler even longer. I think he's like a seven six wingspan. Uh, which is crazy. Uh, he won't play, obviously, because he's out for the year. But then also their leaping ability. Uh, Javier Francis can jump through the roof. So, you know, if you have a guy who's six eight guarding a guy who's seven foot, but you have a four inch longer wingspan, and then your vertical is four inches better than the other guy, what are you losing? So, yeah, I don't know the math on that. I'm not smart enough to figure it out. But that's what they're. That's what they value. They value quickness from their big guys. They they, they want wingspan. They want leaping ability. Uh, a little bit more than they want height from their four and their five spots. So it's more. It's more like athleticism. Sounds like that they are sure. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. And and that's and that's they'll been the key. Athlete, I know they'll take athletes year. over girth. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know they want to. They want to have. Uh, you know they want to have an athletic team on the floor. And then you you'll see it too. Um, pretending what. Duke does offensively, but you'll see their bigs if you do some high pick and rolls and things like that, where they'll do a hard hedge and get to their line of scrimmage. And, you know, they want to, they, they have to have a big that can get back. They have to have a big that can pressure the ball. Um, and if, if you have a seven footer who's slow, he's not capable of doing that. And if you're not capable of doing that, you're not playing on this team. So it's not that, you know, he's anti seven footer. He's just pro give me an athlete at that position. Who's long, fast, can jump high. You know, let's take a step back and take a look at the defense in general because the defense this year has been incredible. I know they're they're one of the top-rated teams in the country on defense, and they've been incredible at taking the ball away. 
And for those who haven't seen Houston play, can you describe their philosophy on defense and how they keep teams off the scoreboard? Because it seems like in a lot of these games, they they emphasize taking the ball away and going the other way, but it's not all that they do on defense. It, it, they're just very strong. I, I know the word strong has been present here, but describe their philosophy on defense. Yeah, that's never really been one of the key principles either is turning teams over. This year's team is pretty unique in that. Uh, it's not to say that all of Samson's teams in Houston haven't, you know, been good at that, but it's usually not the priority. Uh, this team is a little different at the ability to play the passing lanes. And then you have some quick guards who can get their hand on the ball, you know, knock it free, things like that. Uh, but but getting turnovers and steals really isn't like principle, you know, one or two when it comes to this defense. This defense is more about making the offense's life hard, uh, making it work for every shot, making it very difficult to get good looks, taking out the other team's best player. Uh, if you feed the post, do you pressure the post? So they have their system. They have their philosophy of how they're going to do things. Uh, depending on personnel and and they'll switch some stuff up too you know BYU is a really unique opponent the big 12 they have you know five good three-point shooters on the floor a lot of the times Um, and they were having some good success against Houston in the first half make an adjustment in the locker room switch up what you're doing a little bit uh, from a schematic point of view in in a much different second half so they have a belief in what they do with their system um but they also, they're also willing to make quick adjustments if need be if they feel like their system's not really working that day or it, it doesn't have a great look against a very specific personnel. Uh, but their, their core idea is let's, let's make it very difficult for the offense to, A, get good looks, and then, B, whenever they don't get good looks, try to rebound the shots that they miss. It, it certainly has worked out for them on defense. They've been, they've been incredible, as I mentioned, all year. And even on offense, if we switch to the offense for just a second – They've been very good on offense. I think the defense has probably outpaced their offense, but not by much. They've been very good on both sides of the basketball. I think on offense, it feels like they have done it despite the fact that they are not as efficient in several categories. So talk about the offense and how they've developed such a great offense and in scoring a lot of points while not necessarily always being the most efficient team on the floor. Yeah, they get... um. It, when, it, when Houston gets criticized, it, it's about the offensive side of the ball. And, you know, I, I do Houston radio, so I'm a, I'm a bit of a homer. Uh, I'm also a believer in the Ken Palm, and they've been top 15 in offensive efficiency all year. And, you know, they, they don't hand those spots out. you got to be pretty good to, to be a top 15 offensive efficiency team in college basketball. I think sometimes when you look at, you know, our games, they can be a little bit choppy because, you know, we don't give up many shots early in the shot clock. Uh, They're usually slower paced games. It usually doesn't equate to a high scoring game. Not to say that Houston hasn't been in a couple of those and won a couple of those, Uh, but it's, it's usually not this up and down freestyle NBA type of game. It's a little bit more, okay, we're going to play half court basketball. Uh, You're not going to really see a shot in the first 15, sometimes 20 seconds of the shot clock. Houston turns, teams over all the time with shot clock violations but on the offensive end I think it's you have good offensive players I think it starts there uh Jamal Shedd's been asked to do more offensively he can get you 20 on any given night LJ Cryer when his shot's falling he can give you 20 any single night uh same thing with Emmanuel Sharp Emmanuel Sharp had 30 points against Texas A&M he's a good offensive player and then Jawan Roberts his stats are are a little bit misleading he's you know, a veteran, he's been taken out of some games, he's been injured in some games, but he's a guy that, that Houston's very comfortable uh, with some specific matchups of going to the post. Okay, let's feed J1. We feel that if you're going to guard J1 one-on-one, uh, there's nights where he can have a big offensive night. If you send a second man, they like his ability to pass the basketball from the post, which leads to some open shots. Uh, so they, they have some high-quality offensive players. You know, Francis isn't like somebody you're giving the basketball to that's going to be put backs and jump spots, things like that, but he's good at that. You know, he's good at offensive rebounding. He's good at getting to the dunk spot and catching a lob or getting an offensive rebound put back. Uh, so roles, good individual talent. They're a team that moves the ball. They're a team that offensive rebounds at a pretty high level. And then they take care of the ball. You know, they're not, they're not wasting possessions. And if you're not wasting possessions and then you're getting extra possessions with the offensive rebounding and you throw in some pretty good offensive players, uh, I think it can lead to a team that can score the ball pretty well. All right, we're going to take a quick commercial break, Jeremy. Stick around, because after the break, I want to find out from you what scares you about the Duke Blue Devils. What keeps you up at night when you look at Duke? 
That question, that answer, I should say, <laughs> on the other side. Stay with us. This episode of the DBR is brought to you by Better Help. Hey, everybody. This is Jason Evans of the Duke Basketball Roundup podcast. You know, the truth is I'd be lying if I told you I didn't have stuff to work on. <laughs> All my life, I've had a great passion for the things that I wanted to do, like this podcast, but not as much for the things that I was supposed to do. And honestly, it used to get me in trouble sometimes. But some years ago, I started talking about it with a therapist, and, and it really helped. And I learned to embrace the supposed to, not just the want to. And frankly, my life is better for it. If you don't believe me, just ask my wife. Getting advice from people who know how to listen is what better help is all about. It is therapy for the internet era, completely online, making it convenient and flexible to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched to a professional licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time. So visit betterhelp.com slash Duke Roundup today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Duke Roundup. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Okay, I'm going to turn that recording on. All right, we're back from the break. We are still with Jeremy Branham, the voice of the Houston Cougars basketball team. Jeremy, I want to start with this. Uh, Houston's, you know, got an incredible record this season, but they've had some slip-ups, especially lately. What goes wrong when Houston has a game, even if they win the game, where it's, you know, not the result that was expected? What what is it? What are the things that have gone wrong for them that leads to that? Is there is there any pattern? Because like as Duke fans, when Duke loses, we're almost always talking about didn't get the 50-50 balls, didn't have the right effort. Yeah. You know? Is there is there like an underlying thing that happens to Houston when things go south? You know, the, the Iowa State game was such an anomaly in the Big 12 tournament. It was a combination of your, you have a very short roster, your very short bench, lots of injuries. You're playing the third game in three days. You, you had one of your starting players, and Jawan Roberts got hurt in the semifinals. Uh, you had Iowa State that played really well. Uh, they fill out T-Mobile Center in Kansas City, so their crowd lifts them a little bit. That game was a bit of an anomaly. An anomaly. That, was a, that was a weird game. Um, so you have to go back prior to early in conference play, back-to-back -back road games, game two, game three of the conference slate, lost at Iowa State, lost at TCU, and then you lost a game a couple weeks later at Kansas. Um, Kansas was phenomenal the night that they played. The, the Kansas starting five when they played, and they were healthy at the time. They had McCuller. Uh, I thought that was a team that could win a national title. Uh, now they're playing at home, so the home crowd can lift you at times, but that starting five on that night, might have been the best team I've seen all year. Uh, they were phenomenal. Uh, Houston fought, though. You know, they, they had a chance. I think they cut it down to single digits with, like, six or seven minutes to play. And their backup center hit a three from straight on. And then it was really all over from there. Um, Iowa State, they got off to a slow start. I think it was a 14 nothing start. That was second game of the year. So, remember, you kind of slips on that a little bit. And the TCU game, they just really had trouble getting it going offensively. I would say – I don't know if there's any one thing between those four that, that have correlation with the other. Uh, I think if you look at the A&M game, foul trouble certainly was, was something that made that game dicey. 45 free throws, four starters fouled out. Uh, A&M's pretty unique with how they handle their offense. So, you know, you gave them a lot of credit for that as well. I don't know if there's one thing that's a correlation. Um, I think if you look at Houston now, you would love to get them in foul trouble. Um, you would love to get to the free throw line. And because their bench just isn't all that deep, if you can get to their, you know, you get early foul trouble on Francis and Roberts, and now you're playing a couple of guys that don't play a whole lot or, or not as good for an extended period of time, seven, eight minutes, uh, that could certainly change a game. Hey, Jeremy, I, I wanted to go back to this because I know the last couple of games that you had against, or at least two of the games this year against Iowa State, you had Houston had the lowest scores uh, or lowest outputs of, of points in those two games. You mentioned the 41 points in the Big 12 championship, but also during the regular season, I, Iowa State beat uh, Houston and they gave 53 points in that. So is it a, is a simple fact of does Duke needs to pop in the tape of 
Houston versus Iowa State to see what Iowa State did well in those situations? Or is it a situation of those games are just such anomalies in, in the shooting department that you kind of want to toss that film out? No. I mean, I think if, if you look at those two teams, though, those are the two best defensive teams in the country, and both of them play a, not you know a, an amazing tempo. Uh, I know Houston's tempo is like in the 300s, and Iowa State's tempo is like in the 200s. So naturally, you, you put two teams that have below 200 tempos, and you have the top two teams in the country defensively, you're not going to get many points. Like It's going to be one of those nights where teams are shooting with single digits left on the shot clock every trip up the floor. And then both teams are going to make your life miserable getting any sort of offensive look. So, yeah, I mean, I would – sure. I mean, if, if I were scouting the Cougars today and I was playing them in the NCAA tournament, I, I certainly would turn that game on and see what Iowa State's doing that, that slowed down Houston. Now, you know, what is Iowa State's philosophy? I know they play a no-middle defense. Is that something that we do? Are we capable of doing that? Uh, do we have the personnel? I think you guys do. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't think that every team in the country is Iowa State. And I'm not saying that Iowa State's the best team in the country. I'm just saying that when you get Houston and Iowa State together, that are both very good defensively, the best two according to some metrics. They don't play at a very high tempo. That that's just naturally going to be a low-scoring game. Uh, hey, hey, Jeremy, I want to talk to you a little bit about Duke. What's the sense from you know, from the team, from fans, from folks you talk to about playing the Blue Devils. I mean, look, we know we're the the big bad guys of the college basketball world. You know, we get huge ratings because everyone likes to see us lose. You think, are, mm -hmm. are Houston fans excited, apprehensive? How would you describe things? Yeah, I think there's, there's two perspectives to look at it from. Uh, the fan perspective, yeah, you're playing a name brand school. Uh, that's really fun, right? I mean, I think that we watch sports to be entertained and to you know, be excited about it. So whenever you play Duke versus non-name brand school 101, yeah, you're going to have a lot more interest uh, in that from a fan's perspective. Now, from a, a team perspective, uh, they couldn't care less who, which, what the name of the university is. Uh, they're, they're, all their attention is going to be on the personnel. Uh, Samson tells a story from years ago when they played Kentucky in the Sweet 16, maybe four or five years ago, maybe they had Tyler Hero. I think it was Washington with them back then as well. A really good team. But you're not, you're not you're playing Kentucky. You're playing the guy. You're playing the personnel. You're playing the roster. So when you know Houston's getting ready for this game coming up on Friday, and they've been getting ready for it all week, and you know, they'll have practice tomorrow, and then they'll have shoot around Friday. It's not Duke. It's okay. Your guard, you're guarding Roach, or how do we defend McCain? What's the game plan against Filipowski? And that's what you do every time, every game. Like when you're playing Iowa State, it's not we're playing the Cyclones tonight. It's you're gonna have to guard. You know, you're gonna have to guard their point guard. You're gonna have to get out here on Mom Chilovich. Uh, this is how we're going to box out Jones. So it's just stay in that course, stay in that process. But from a fan's point of view, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a sexy matchup. You get Duke, Houston, first time in program history. The fans love that, uh, and they should because it's fun. It's exciting. It's a Sweet 16 game, Houston-Duke. That's great. Uh, but from a, a player point of view, coach point of view, they're they're more worried about the personnel. All right. Well, you led me perfectly into my next question, which is who is the player – that's keeping Kelvin Sampson up at night. Who's the guy that, you know, if you had to look at someone and go, this, if Duke wins, this is the guy who gave us a problem. I think, I think you can tell all of them, right? Um, I, I'll I take that. Being so hot, <laughs> <laughs> I think with McCain being so hot in the, in the last game, that's somebody that you are certainly going to grab your attention. What was it? He broke the, the mo the record for the most three pointers in a, in a game ever at Duke. Or was that a freshman record? I, I, I have it in my fresh, notes. It was a fresh it was, record. It was all, no, it was all time. Uh, oh, it was all eight. Time. Yep. B. Quinn Cook. Yeah, eight. Yeah, eight. So I, I did, okay, I do remember that one correctly. Uh, he also was joking with Shire about breaking some other record, but I couldn't quite put two and two together to understand what record that was. Do you guys know? Is it all-time points record, all-time freshman points record? No, I, 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 the other thing that they talked about a bit, record. the other thing they talked about a bit was he was, I want to say, was it the first freshman in, in in the in in Duke history to have thirty points? Um, and was, no turnovers or something he, like that. He was the first. He okay. was the first freshman since 
the NCAA tournament expanded to have 30 points with zero turnovers. That was it, yeah. Okay. I know he and Shire were joking something at the press conference where he, Shire took him out early because it was a blowout game. He's like, hey, you should have left me in. I would have got your record or something like that. But I couldn't put two and two together to understand which record it was. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, tremendous game. So you get a shooter like that, he's going to have your attention. I know that Houston, you know, they brought him a cannon on an official visit too. So, you know, they know him pretty well. They certainly respect him. Uh, Kelvin Sampson, I was watching his press conference uh, earlier this week, and he he had nothing but positive say, things to say about Jared McCain. Said he thinks he's going to be a great pro. Uh, really likes him. But then you have Filipowski too, who's a really good offensive player, a really good player. Um, you, you go back to the Kansas game and some things that Dickinson did um, really hurt Houston. You know, I think Filipowski's capable of doing some of those things as well. So I think it starts there. But you have to, you certainly have to respect everybody else. Proctor can beat you. Roach can beat you. Mitchell is a very athletic four. I was watching the some of the NC State game uh, last night actually, and, and that guy just he, he he looks the part. He's fast. He's big. He's athletic. So. Yeah, we, we, call, we call Mark respect. Mitchell bad intentions. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to look like that. You know, in fact, whenever I look in the mirror, I like to think I look like that. <laughs> hey, Jeremy, bad real quick. Is a good nickname. Yeah, we, we love it. We love it when he has bad intentions. Hey, you know, real quick. I know we're running out of time, but Houston, a few days ago, uh, gave a jersey, a custom jersey to none other than Drake. And... I know everyone knows about the Drake curse and everyone's afraid of the Drake curse. Are fans worried about the Drake curse coming to Houston by you guys giving them that Jersey? I don't know if our biggest fans know about the Drake curse, quite frankly. Uh, I did hear some, you know, Houston sports fans in the city talking about that. Now he was a big Raptors fan, right? Didn't they win a title? Didn't they win a title with Drake sitting courtside? Yep. Yeah, yep. so, I mean, how cursy is this curse exactly? Like, if you're winning a championship <laughs> at some point, like, this isn't the curse of the Bambino. This isn't the Billy Goat. Uh, I think this is a very minor curse compared to all of the other great curses we've had in Houston sports history. Uh, I don't know where the Drake curse stacks up, but I don't know if it makes the top ten. <laughs> all right, J- Jeremy, we're going to wrap up with this, my friend, and I appreciate you giving us all this time this evening. Uh I got to get a prediction from you. And I know you're a Houston homer. You got to be. But tell me how you think this game turns out. Yeah, I don't do the predictions. Sorry to disappoint you guys. I predict it's going to be a uh, a really good game on Friday. Um, I've, I've poured a lot of time into Duke this week. And I, I love this Blue Devil team. I think it's really talented. I think it's really good. I, I really like Shire as a coach, too. Uh, listening to his press conference, I've become a fan of it. I, I, I know who John Shire is. I know he took over for Coach K. I haven't listened to a, a single John Shire press conference prior to this week, and then I've listened to hours of John Shire this week and really impressed by him. Um, so I'm a, I'm a heavy respect for Duke just for the history, but I really like this year's roster. I think the world of, uh, of Shire is a head coach. You know, so I think it's going to be a really good game. I think some of these matchups are really interesting, too. Like, I'm very curious to see how Houston defends McCain, how they defend Filipowski. Uh, I want to see how Houston attacks Duke defensively. You know, see, see if they attack Filipowski defensively. I don't know. So I'm excited for it. I can't wait. I think you have two really good teams. I think both of these teams are capable of winning Friday and, and winning more games in the NCAA tournament. So uh, I'm, I'm chomping at the bit. I can't wait. We, we are, too, my friend. Jeremy Branham, Houston Basketball Radio. Thank you so much. We appreciate all the insight you gave to us. I'd say good luck, man, but I just can't go there. (laughs) (laughs) I understand. I understand. Thanks for having me on. I enjoyed the conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Donald, I think we are very, very lucky to have had a guest like that, someone who quite literally watches every single game because he's the guy telling the fans what's going on. I mean, that's 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 he's got the best seat in the house. What's that? He's got the best seat in the house. Like it's, it's a great, it's a great perspective. Amen. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, folks, if you think uh, that was a good preview, wait until you hear what's coming next. We are, we are Donald and I going to do our deep dive into Houston. We'll have that for you tomorrow in your feed or depending on when you listen to it. 
to this episode. Maybe it's today in your feed. I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, th- that's coming up next as the DBR prepares for the Sweet 16 against the Houston Cougars. Again, our thanks to Jeremy Branham of Houston Basketball Radio. He's Donald Wine with the fixed computer. I'm Jason Evans. I've been here the whole time. This is the Duke Band. They've been in the background. They've been waiting, warming up. Here's the Duke Band. They're playing us out, taking us home.